You are listening to Middle East Monitor Conversations, bringing you lively discussions with prominent voices from the region and beyond as we delve deeper into issues shaping the Middle East and North Africa, from politics to culture and the arts. Hello, welcome to Memo Conversations. I'm Azm Butter, video producer. My, ge- my guest today is Melise, um, Melise Hafez. Melise Hafez is an associate professor at the Virginia Commonwealth University. She received her PhD in history from UCLA. Her book, Inventing Laziness, The Culture of Productivity in Late Ottoman Society, came out from Cambridge University Press in 2021. Melise, welcome to Memo Conversations. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. And it's our pleasure to have you. So I think we should start right, obviously, at the beginning. You know, there's all sorts of things in the world you could study to do with history, to do with empire. What drew you to want to study laziness and productivity in the late Ottoman Empire? Oh, thank you for this uh, great question. It's it's great because it makes me think about the uh, earlier phases of my uh, work on uh, laziness and as you know, as soon as I utter that word, the phrase, I know that it is very oxymoronic work on laziness. Um, at the beginning of my studies, I was uh, reading, um, randomly reading Ottoman cultural products from the 19th century. And um, something I found striking was the fact that um, regardless of the diversity of these you know, cultural products, uh, ranging from novels to pamphlets, reform bills to to morality books, uh, textbooks, petitions. Through all that diversity, I realized that there was the centrality of uh, the issue of uh, productivity, issue of work and efficiency, and I. Um, f- for me, that was something striking that, you know, connected all these, you know, uh, uh, cultural products uh, to each other. This, you know, this certain anxiety about, you know, uh, work and the valuation of work. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the, the, the way they formulated, the way they talked about work was not merely as an individual matter, but it was, you know, it was um, not, was not even an economic matter. It was also a moral matter. It was a national matter. And they talked about laziness, not merely as, as you know, as an individual condition, uh, but um, as, as a national problem, as a social disease that each and every member of the nation, of the emerging Ottoman nation, has to fight, has to defeat on a daily basis. And this kind of a a formulation was striking for me because I, I mean, we are very familiar with this language, right? In the 21st century, this is something that we are, you know, uh, uh, imbued with, this kind of an, um, you know, understanding of work as an indicator of value and not only you know personal value or you know um um social value but also national value and the way they talked about laziness is something that is strikingly similar to our you know codification of laziness as something that you have to defeat in yourself in your home in your institution in your nation and 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 you know uh, once i saw this you know similarity and i don't want to collapse of course the 19th century you know processes with the 21st century processes because you know the the, um the dynamics of the you know capitalist market economy has changed drastically but um these notions um these you know um meaning universes uh came to being uh in the 19th century that these you know the way we understand and value work and productivity and efficiency and and uh demonize laziness has a history and um this history definitely includes this, you know, concept of, you know, laziness, right? Um, and the word, you know, even the word is, is, it's the code word, right? When we think about, you know, how laziness is used in our worlds and in the 19th century as well, it's it's um, it's a code word for structuring difference, right? 
um, difference, uh, structuring difference on, 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 on a national level, right? We are the nation of productive, we are a productive nation and they are not, right? Um, structuring difference on a class level, which is something we are, you know, quite familiar with in the 21st century still, um, that, you know, uh, the poor is poor because they are lazy. If they could just work harder, right? Definitely disregarding all the systemic inequalities of the capitalist system, this you know conceptualization of you know uh, power, poverty, uh, this you know uh, uh, identification of poverty with laziness, and even more so, I mean, there's national and and class differences, uh, but also you know structuring racial differences. Some races are believed to be, you know, inherently lazy. They are not even, you know, it, they cannot be even reformed, right? And this opens up to all levels of uh, subjugation, right? Uh, this um, understanding of, you know, laziness as, as you know, structuring difference, the justification uh, for uh, many levels of uh, subjugation, including colonialism and, you know, this you know, the civilizational approach, the usage of the civilizational approach. So when I saw these, you know, uh, very modern formulations of uh, work and also consciousness of the value of work, not merely, you know, whatever work is, but the consciousness about um the value of work. When I saw these similarities, I thought, you know, this could be something quite interesting to look at, to be able to see the dynamic, to be able to, you know, um, the, understand the dynamics of change and transformation that are taking place within the Ottoman Empire in connection with the global changes. But something that, you know, looking at this, the construction of this dynamic binary between uh, work and laziness and, you know, who is labeled lazy, right? Uh, these are quiet, vague terms. So who, who is considered, excuse me, to be, you know, productive? That kind of, um, you know, establishment of that binary would reveal so many intricacies, dynamics of an Ottoman transformation that is both Ottoman and modern at the same time. So this is how I started, you know, thinking about this issue and um, ended up writing a book on it. Yes, it was a it was a very interesting read, as you know. I obviously went through it, uh, but before we sort of go further into laziness and productivity, the idea it's sort of as you say in your book, it's sort of coated in the rise of well, not so much rise, but sort of arise. I mean, the fact is that you have this genre of literature which you analyze in your book, um, which is, I think the rough English translation would be something like advice literature, right? And in the past, you point out that advice literature looked at the failings of, you know, policies in the Ottoman Empire as being the faults of institutions and elites and specific things. And rarely do people, everyday people come into it, unless it's to talk about ways that they've suffered from particular policies. But in the 19th century, we see a massive shift towards more discussion about people's everyday morality and why, you know, bad morality leads to bad outcomes. So could you perhaps talk to us about this genre of literature that came in the 19th century? What is it? What is morality? Tell us about it. Oh, this is a great question. And I don't think you're wrong about, you know, talking about this rise. Uh, there's something, you know, interesting about them. I, I call them morality texts. They come in a variety of formats. They come in, you know, books that are titled morality, that they, they come in, you know, uh, in the 19th century, they come in, you know, in the forms of novels and plays uh, as well. But I call them, you know, morality texts in general. You're talking about a rise. The, the interesting thing about these morality texts, they go back for, you know, multiple millennia. The, the, it's a very established, if I may say so, traditional genre uh, with all the, its own dynamics throughout different, you know, uh, historical periods. But uh, when it comes to the 19th century, there is this something is is um, very old and very transformative at the same time. 
uh, in you know the content, the format, the authors. There's so many levels of change at the same time continuity. I mean, when I started looking at these texts, I realized that you know I, I recognized so many different many uh, differences, changes from the earlier formulations of what morality is. As I advanced, I realized there are so many different continuities as well. And the 19th century moralists, in my case, the Ottoman moralists, and morality is a global issue in the 19th century. So it's not only the Ottomans that are, I mean, Americans are, you know, producing so many morality books, quite secular looking at the same time, you know, you know it, it's different. It is very difficult to look at these texts and talk about them as traditional or, you know, secular. They're just, they defy these, you know, uh, uh, binaries and, um, they actually help us understand that these binaries are not functioning anymore. Um, so um, there is this, in the historiography, there's this um, um, disregard for the morality texts produced in the 19th, I mean, until recently, I should say, but um, until recently, these, you know, books came up in the books of history by historians uh, as, you know, um, elements of tradition like continuity purely you know uh ref purely formulating age-old maxims and um at best at worst they are you know defending the traditional values against you know westernizing forces but i i think it has to do a lot with the with the um current emphasis on morality conservative emphasis on morality that these historians just uh, did not see how um, transformed this genre is, how it combined new and uh, old discourses and it produced so many new ideas. Or maybe I shouldn't say produce, but it became a, a genre within which many new ideas are articulated. But once we go past that kind of, you know, uh, assumptions of conservatism that's you know, uh, colored by our understanding of morality today, uh, we see so many dynamic changes uh, in the genre of morality. Uh, this is actually my second uh, book project, so I shouldn't go into the entire genre discussion here, but um, let me start with the numbers, right? The, the, um, there were like around 150 morality books produced in the last 50 years, 60 years of the empire. So these are, you know, amazing numbers. Um, although, you know, the, the genre has been very popular uh, in the early modern era, one of the most, you know, popular genres, you know, morality books, you have it next to your Quran, you know, how to improve yourself. Um, the, the, that, you know, the, um, um, the involvement with the uh, morality uh, issues, um, writing morality texts is going to explode in the 19th century. Um, the authors are quite different, right? They are not these highly erudite, intellectual, scholarly, members of scholarly community. Very few of them in the 19th century are members of the ulama, the scholarly, Islamic scholarly community. Many of them are just, you know, mid rank bureaucrats and teachers, secondary school teachers or um, doctors and <laughs> soldiers, you know, um, they wrote these, you know, morality books. Um, I have a, um, a good example for you. Um, especially for the audiences in the UK. Um, Ali Kemal, a name that might be familiar to you as the great grandfather of Boris Johnson. In his, yeah, Ali Kemal wrote a morality book. This is, he, he's a very famous or infamous uh, politician, uh, polemician, uh, what else, uh, a statesman uh, as well. So in his early 20s, he wrote a morality book. So it gives you an idea that, you know, Many different, you know, members of the Ottoman uh, um, educated classes wrote, you know, at one point in their lives wrote morality books. Um, when I said, you know, there are 150, uh, let me just explain that 150 in Ottoman Turkish using the Arabic alphabet, Ottoman alphabet. Um, we have to factor in, I mean, I didn't do this in my book. Uh, I hope to do this in my coming book. Um, I, I, we have to factor in all these different languages that are, you know, 
being spoken in the uh, the multilingual Ottoman Empire, and uh, I don't think I can do that. It's beyond my abilities. But I want to explore also the books in uh, written on morality within uh, in Turkish using different alphabets like Armenian and Greek alphabets. So if we factor them in, actually numbers are even greater than 150. Um, they're important for this project. They're important because they uh, they gave me, they revealed to me the uh, the major, you know, articulations uh, of um, what I call moralization of uh, work and productivity. And um, these books contain a massive, massive reformulation of old terms. Uh, in 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 a very modern way, and they uh, they also introduced new terms in in the in in a very old way as well. So they combined these, you know, uh, what through a very binaristic approach, what you see as traditional and modern, but they they brought together these variety of different concepts together, and they articulated through these notions, they articulated a, 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 a very uh, um, uh, strong um, moral, a language of moralization uh, of productivity. Um, I like to talk about the change in the format as well, because that's going to also contribute to the understanding of the concept of civic duty, of work as a civic duty. Um, the earlier, early modern morality books were based on virtue ethics. Mm. Um, I mean, you, there are vices that you have to stay away from, that you have to cleanse yourself from, and there are virtues. And you have to obtain a golden mean. This is called golden mean ethics that goes back to the uh, Greek uh, 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 ethics. In the 19th century, although the genre is the same, uh, they stay away from that virtues and vices. I mean, it still continues, but they organize these books, the moralists of the Ottoman Empire, they organize these books based on the concept of duty. So there are duties to self, okay, un understandable, uh, duties to society, duties to the state, something that you don't get to see in the earlier versions. Uh, in the earlier versions, in the early modern period morality text, duty does not appear, almost doesn't appear. The concept of duty is a very 19th century concept. So within that shift, they articulate work as not only an individual duty, but as a social duty, as a national duty. At the same time, it is uh, an Islamic duty. So it's just bringing all of, of, of these, you know, uh, different justifications or, you know, strengthening methods together. And laziness is not only a personal vice that you have to fight against. It's not a condition, personal condition. <clears throat> it's, you know, it's a national problem that each and every member has to defeat in themselves, around themselves, in their institutions, something that, you know, very familiar to us in the 20th, 21st century. And, and within this concept of, you know, uh, duty, they talk about the also the their duty, the moralist duty of eradicating uh, laziness from the national scene. So this is something that is quite um, um, new when you think about the 19th century context. And they, they talk about these in a very exclusionary way. Um, the label uh, of lazy, right? Whom they identify as lazy. I mean, there are so many, um, articulations of exclusionary languages that will keep operating even after the empire's collapse. You mentioned, obviously, um, the fact that what we might today can term sort of conservative morality or, you know, conservative ideas of morality, you know, giving rise to, you know, in the, in the guise of it being conservative morality, actually giving rise to transformation of entire concepts. Um, and in the book, you actually do talk a little bit about how certain, let's say, religious and Islamic con concepts, which have been around for a long time, subtly start to change. And in some cases, bi bigger changes start to happen with them in regards to work and laziness and the impact it has. So could you perhaps give us some more examples of that? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you know, 
this shift took place um, in the uh, morality texts away from virtues and vices, uh, um, kind of a morality to duty-based morality. We start seeing, you know, all these what you would identify as Islamic norms appearing. Some of them uh, are just um, praises for, you know, for doing good work, whatever, you know, that means, right? Uh, um, they employ, it's interesting because, you know, most of these books are very Ottomanist in their outlook. I mean, of course, it depends on who wrote it and what, you know, decade they were written and the position or political position of the person, of the, you know, author in a given decade, because it also changes. Uh, but they, they talk about this, you know, um, these Islamic uh, notions uh, that they argue that are misunderstood, right? Um, resignation, right? You entrusting your work to God. And they try to reformulate it um, by arguing that, you know, resignation doesn't mean laziness or, you know, the, the saying of the prophet, al-fakru al, al fakhri, um, that laziness is my pride. And they take pages and pages arguing against the immediate understanding or what they call the misunderstanding of this concept. It is not, you know, laziness, meaning, you know, being poor. It's not, it's not poverty in the sense of being poor. It is poverty as opposed to the, you know, the power of, you know, the, the, the greatness of God. So they try to reformulate these. And when they're doing these uh, reformulations, they also add new concepts. Uh, they Islamize, Islamize and moralize new concepts. Um, um, money is, um, um, time is money. Turns it, it, it appears in these books that it is actually a saying of the prophet Muhammad which is not, <laughs> it's a very 19th century concept, right? Time is money. So they 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 take these, I mean, I don't want to say use because this is their outlook. This is their understanding of the world and they want to, this is their understanding of their own religion. Um, and they are articulating these, uh, you know, meanings that um that are very new but to them that are very vital for the survival of their nation and and the survival of the ottoman state and the eradication of laziness as you know as a hindrance to progress yes and um so when we think about the ways in which these new concepts transform ottoman society uh with I think you know in the book you talk a lot about how you know people's everyday lives are being this is not just something that's happening among a few officials or whatever it is something that's actually transforming the empire the way people spend their time how time is thought about but also you know systems are put in place to incentivize work so could you perhaps talk to us a little bit how the state incentivizes people to work more um yeah, this is this is a great another great question. Um, I mean, first you have to make everyone believe that they have been lazy for centuries, <laughs> that they have to uh, put you know hard like uh, put forward the the hard you know their hard work and 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 change the fate of not only their own you know lives but change the fate of their of their empire that it is actually the duty of each and every member of the ottoman nation to you know shoulder this burden uh and I, this is just an amazing language because you know this is going to continue into way you know into our you know 20th century 21st century this understanding of civic duties um in 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 the book i in a very detailed way i mean how, how can i make this work boring i looked at the bureaucratic reforms uh but i looked at the bureaucratic reforms i mean uh thankfully not as an institutional historian but as a cultural historian um so i i wasn't concerned about you know um if the bureaucratic reforms that were implemented worked or not but how the uh, bureaucratic reforms um, uh, um, advanced 
or made even more pervasive this anxiety about laziness all across the empire. So um, let me talk about the Ottoman you know, state to the, the changes uh, that the Ottoman state went through in the 19th century. I mean, Ottoman Empire has always been a bureaucratic state, right? Uh, but uh, in the 19th century, the state structures are going to um, expand exponentially. The, um, the, um, uh, the, along the lines of modern state, bureaucracy is going to centralize, thousands of thousands of more people, as opposed to the 18th century, are going to be employed by the state. And it, this is something interesting, because when we think about, you know, state employees, uh, we're talking about a very large group of people, um, especially after the 1870s, uh, very large group of people who are coming from diverse backgrounds all across the empire from a variety of different, you know, uh, confessional groups. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the the state employee is not usually, you know, we, we think about these effendis in Istanbul, but then we have all these, you know, people who are employed by the state in a corner of uh, Syria, in a corner of Anatolia, who are just, you know, who only have like five years of education, who knows how to read and write, and employed by the state, but has never seen Istanbul, has never seen a major city, maybe. So there is, you know, that kind of a uh, pervasiveness of the uh, bureaucratic, uh, um, uh, pervasiveness of the anxiety about work uh, through these, you know, uh, offices throughout the empire. Um, I looked at these and I I wondered how did it affect uh, the daily lives of these, you know, bureaucrats of various ranks? Uh, how did it affect their daily life? How did it affect their um, understanding of what work is and what, you know, laziness is because these are very elastic terms and it's, they're going to use it to their advantage for sure. Um, and and um, with the expansion of the bureaucracy, we start seeing all these, you know, reform bills and codes and 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 uh, memorandums being sent all over the empire that the, the productivity has to be increased, efficiency has to be increased, laziness is actually now a crime. Um, again, very vague, but I call this, you know, criminalization of laziness in the bureaucratic offices. Uh, and, you know, this, this, these, you know, laws and reforms had teeth. Um, I found more than 100 people, I mean, in the archives uh, that are removed from their posts for being lazy. You know, of course, you know, you cannot take these at face value, but this is the official language for not being efficient. And um, I mean, a couple of things. I, 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 it's really hard to summarize all these, you know, changes that are taking place in the bureaucratic offices and how it is connected to larger cultural transformations. But uh, I like to highlight two things. One, these concepts, how negotiated these concepts were. Within the bureaucratic system, we have these, you know, um, um, control mechanisms. Uh, being established after 18, uh, 1870s, these control mechanisms are going to, you know, meet out all these uh, um, punishments for those who are, you know, committing laziness in the offices. But we hear back from the bureaucrats, and and no one wants to be called lazy. And even those who are called lazy or labeled lazy are never lazy when it comes to, you know, <laughs> saying no to these labels. They write petitions. They write. Um, uh, uh, letters to the state uh, uh, inspection offices, and they claim that they have they they never been lazy. They are actually hard workers, but it is you know the workload, this you know irrational amount of workload. Uh, so we we see how you know these concepts are not merely you know distributed from top down, but also negotiated, and they're reinstated back to their positions. Uh, some of them. Uh, most of them are going to go back, come back to their position. So it shows us how these concepts are negotiated. And the second one is has to do more with the larger cultural transformations. I, when I found out that most of the authors of morality books were at one point in their lives were members of the Ottoman bureaucracy, I realized the connection between 
um, moralization of work and a bureaucrat uh, bureaucratization of work as well, right? The connection between um, the uh, field of morality, how it changed, and the field of bureaucracy and how that changed, the connection is, is quite in interesting because it gives us how a very pragmatic state reform of eradicating, you know, a perceived laziness in the offices increased that is, you know, increase the uh, uh, um, um, anxiety about laziness that's already circulating in the public sphere, uh, and and made these um, moralists uh, experience it in their daily lives. Uh, one of the morality book authors was an inspector, for instance. So he he was just, you know, meeting out these punishments to his, you know, um, uh, fellow employees. So that kind of, that connection between uh, those who wrote morality texts and, and those who were, you know, day in and day out experienced the anxiety about laziness. Um, I, I, you know, it, this kind of, a, you know, connection makes us realize that um, this, there's something very Ottoman about these transformations, that these guys who wrote morality books didn't do that because they, you know, went to Europe and they saw how productive these, you know, Europeans are and they admired the cities. They experienced this very modern anxiety about laziness and work in the context of the Ottoman reforms by partaking within the Ottoman reforms. And that actually uh, is something that I found uh, to be uh, quite interesting and eye-opening when we think about the larger uh, Ottoman transformations. Yes, and today in the Middle East, how have, you know, where are we today with the, you know, because you were obviously mentioning particularly the start of your book uh, you know, when you mention what topic you're sort of studying, people sort of think that you're like, oh, okay, so you're going to tell us how things got so, you know, why everyone is so lazy here. And there's sort of two reactions, obviously, from the outside world, from Westerners, there's this obviously perception people in the Middle East are lazy. But what's interesting about this perception is a lot of Middle Easterners themselves think they're lazy as well. At least think other people around them are pretty lazy. Um, so with that sort of in mind, what is the legacy of cultural productivity in the Middle East and the world today? Uh, another amazing question. And I, I, I am not sure if I can respond in a you know, comprehensive or uh, uh, way, but um, um, of course, with these, you know, with the culture of productivity comes with, with this understanding that it, this internalist from the perspective of the residents of the Middle East, this internalist understanding of why we are here today. Um, by, by that, I mean, you know, the, they, they see it as something that the regions of the Middle East have, have, something, have done something wrong. Of course, this totally disregards the inherent inequalities of the capitalist world system that has, you know, subjugated these regions, although, you know, this, there's so much negotiation and so much resistance and so much uh, um, um, transformations taking place in the region. But, you know, it is for sure starting, you know, sometime early in the 19th century, these regions have become um, marginalized uh, by the or by the center of the um, capitalist uh, world system. Uh, so that, you know, once you disregard these, you know, global structures of inequality, you are left with this, you know, more moralized way of approaching what went wrong, a very uh, Luigian way of asking that question. And of course, you know, this is some, I mean, you have to also identify the impetus of reform. Uh, in this question, like why have become why why are we lazy or how do we get out of being lazy? It's also a language of reform that has been you know circulating at least in the last seventy years of the Ottoman Empire. It's you know to be able to introduce or implement new reforms, you have to also believe that you have done something totally wrong. So there's that you know. <laughs> Uh, understanding of you know the uh, having this model of reform in these languages is also something that I, I have to acknowledge here. Um, so um, 
how I mean, when we talk about the legacy of these uh, reforms, uh, we can we can think about you know multiple uh, processes that are you know taking place in twenty first twentieth and twenty first centuries. Uh, for sure, the culture of productivity, with all its exclusionary aspects, its uh, moralizing aspects, its internalist critique. Um, has survived the Ottoman Empire, has you know outsurvived the Ottoman uh, state structure. So we can see that you know it contributed to the um, 20th century um, uh, state reforms of the what you know historians call the ethos of developmentalism. Uh, it contributed to the nationalistic discourses heavily. <laughs> contributed to the nationalistic discourses in the post-imperial period. Um, I can think of examples from the uh, Republic of Turkey. Um, I I recited as a, as a um, grade school child in the 80s, uh, 1980s, uh, uh, a pledge, uh, what is called the Our Pledge, Andamans, Our Pledge. And this is how it starts. I'm Turkish, I'm honest, I'm industrious. So the third, you know, the second qualification after the declaration of being Turkish, whatever that means, uh, is, you know, is, you know, being industrious. Of course, you have to understand how exclusionary this is when you think about the, um, the, 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 you know, the turbulence that the Ottoman Empire's last decades went through, all the, you know, violent eradication of age-old communities from the Ottoman, from the lands that turned, that became Repub the Republic of, Republic of Turkey, all the minorities in every sense, that uh, they had to recite this for, you know, for, for decades, um, hopefully not anymore, but it can come back anytime, so... Um, they they had to recite this kind of an, a nationalist nationalized discourse of you know productivity as making it you know a component of a certain nation and excluding everyone else. Of course, you know you have to. I mean, you have to realize that nineteenth century exclusionary discourses were vague, but they opened the, these you know they made they how do I say they made these you know. Uh, contexts, um, historical realities uh, possible. Um, going back to the Turkish case, um, in the early Republican period, for instance, um, the question of who is lazy and who is idle, right, uh, was the, the answer to that question was given in a very definitive way, right? So what institutions are considered to be producing not culture of productivity, but culture of laziness. And with that kind of a blast writing into, you know, blasphemous language uh, in the early decades of the Republican period, Turkey, um, um, madrasas were abolished. Sufi lodges were abolished because they are, you know, written into that blasphemous language. And, um, you know, seeing these as merely Republican uh, doings is just cutting the 19th century roots uh, from it. Um, in the 30s, for instance, uh, Turkish radio or national radio in Turkey banned um, Ottoman-style music. And um, uh, with the, you know, justification that, a very, you know, like very 19th century justification, right? Justification that it, it produces laziness. It's, it induces laziness. So uh, Ottoman music was, you know, banned uh, for almost like a year and a half from the national radio with this kind of a justification that, you know, the, the, that kind of a justification, that language has been circulating around for at least, you know, seven years. But, you know, answers are very radical and very drastic and draconian in the Republican era. So we definitely see these, you know, um, changes and continuities within this culture of productivity and how it is, you know, used to justify um, uh, abolition of certain institutions or uh, marginalization of certain uh, groups within, uh, within a given nation state. Yes, yes, it's it's uh, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting topic, really, because obviously, you know, 
it does carry on to the Republic, as you've sort of illustrated. And even if the sort of language around it changes slightly, it's the same basic thing that comes in in the 19th century. Um, but I, I do sort of have a question of mine, which I want to ask, my, my, was my second to last question, and I've got, then we'll go on to the last one, which is, this may be a bit too big a question, uh, but you know, in what way is, what differences do you actually see between the way Turk, Turks and Turkish historians understand, you know, Turkish history, particularly in the early Republican period, from the way outsiders make sense of it. And I was thinking about this uh, because I've, you know, the way it's sort of told to us, for example, take, for example, the Adhan, the Azan, right, which is traditionally was done in Arabic. Uh, but then in the early Republican period, it was sent, it was changed to Turkish, right? That was part of the early reforms. And it's not until the 50s it comes back in. And the way that we sort of people on the outside world have tried understood it as this was specifically a secularist anti-Islam move by the Turkish state. But when I was talking to a Turkish friend about it, she had a very different understanding of it. She was saying to me, oh, we didn't really think of it as an anti-Islam thing. We saw it as an anti-Arab thing specifically. <laughs> so I'm sort of wondering about the divergence of discourses here. I mean, you don't have to comment on that particular example, but are there like ways that that sort of comes out to you? Um. I mean, I, I don't think you're wrong and I don't think she's wrong uh, either. I mean, th there are so many different elements that play into that kind of a, a radical Turkification. So radical Turkification, I mean, you've seen this in, in you know, in the uh, modernity discourses in Iran as well, that, you know, cutting out the, of course, these are quite new ways of formulating, cutting out the Arab uh, components of Islam, uh, and uh, this is something that you see in the 1980s Turkey as well, like well, this quite infamous Turkish um, Islamic Turkish synthesis. It's not merely Islamic, it's not merely Turkish, whatever these concepts mean, of course, uh, but uh, a combination. This is something that, you know, that became uh, structured in the 1980s, so quite recent. Um, Yes, um, there are, I mean, um, of course, with the Republican period, we have this uh, discourse that this is a radical break, whatever that has come before, that has been, you know, um, uh, invalidated, it is, it, it, it didn't work. I mean, I, for my new, you know, book, I'm looking at this con con concept of cosmopolitanism. So it, it, it has nothing to do with Arabness. It has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, but the, the term cosmopolitanism is used as, 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 as a bad word, right? Pejorative word. Not merely a pejorative word, but as, as something that you have to steer away from. So Ottoman Empire has been cosmopolitan. It has been Islamic hasn't. <laughs> it has been, you know, um, ruled by Sharia. It wasn't ruled by Sharia, right? So it's just the, the, um, this kind of a, a, you know, revolutionary language that we are introducing something new. And what has been there before has been proven wrong. So with that kind of a revolutionary discourse, I'm not saying it was revolutionary, but you know how it was constructed to be revolutionary. Comes with you know extreme Turkification, uh, um, the uh, more ethnic conceptualizations, uh, conceptualization of Turkishness, um, uh, and and um, a stance against an Ottoman Islam or an Islam altogether. But again, you know, you have to understand this in the context of post-World War I anti-Arab discourses as well. That, you know, now they are no longer, I mean, um, there are new books that talk about how it was a possibility in the 1920s that Turkey and Syria would be, you know, one federated state. Uh, but the historiography does not even, dwell on that, that, you know, as if, you know, 1916 with the well, so-called Arab revolt, all of a sudden, you know, all the bridges were just burned between the two supposedly distinct nations. But um, uh, the historiography once, you know, the early Republican historiography, especially, you know, produced until recently, wants to, you to believe in that kind of a break. 
rather than the continuity or rather than um, uh, alternatives that could have been quite historically possible. I don't know if I your question. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting area because, of course, I think people today forget, because even in Arab countries, Syria, Iraq, they tend to think of the break as well, don't they? I mean, they, you know, they think, you know, it was Syria, Syrian Arab nationalism, or it was Iraq. But, you know, in the, even up until the 1920s, a lot of the ones in the Syrian revolt in the 1920s, some of them thought they were going to join Turkey, right? They revolted. And there were Christian Arabs in Syria who were revolting, thinking they would join Turkey and become part of Ataturk's state, but never did because he and Ataturk sort of indicated he wasn't interested. Then they went to Syrian nationalism. And up until, you know, the revolts among the Kurds, you know, much of northern Iraq could have been part of Turkey at one point as well. It's, it's a rich area. But I was also thinking when you were talking about the Turkification process, the way in which Islamic scholars in Turkey responded to this, because uh, I interviewed Philip Dorrell, I think his name Philip Dorrell, uh, a few uh, last year or the year before, and he's done this whole study on Turkish nation, no, no, Turkishness, Turkish, no, Turkishization of Islamic discourses. And one of the things he noticed is that um, Turkish scholars came very interested in Imam Mutaridi, who's from Central Asia. And the reason they were so part of the reason why they were so interested in him is that because he was Central Asian, he might have been a Turk. And so they're being patriotic by referring to him. Uh, but it sort of uh, leads into our last question that you've already started to talk about, which is um, what are you working on now? What is coming up for you? Uh, but what you were saying is also kind of interesting because you find attacks against cosmopolitanism everywhere right you like you find attacks on cosmopolitanism in the soviet union you know even against certain groups you can talk about they would, would accuse say jewish group jewish people in the soviet union of being rootless cosmopolitans and even in political discourses in america it's like you know when you've got a republican administration they sort of accuse liberals right that of being too cosmopolitan and not in touch with the real America. <laughs> so it is something that exists here too. I'm wondering then if you could tell us a little bit about your work coming up. Yeah, um, I mean, I just want to say something about cosmopolitanism. I, I mean, it's also a trope, right? I mean, this idea that there was this cosmopolitan world. I mean, whatever value you attach to it. Uh, with equal footing. I mean, we know that things happen in the Ottoman Empire that is, has, you know, that defies this uh, rosy picture of cosmopolitanism. So I wasn't, you know, I mean, I wasn't, uh, how do I say this? I wasn't uh, promoting cosmopolitanism because I don't, yeah, yeah. It, it is a problematic term that has to be, you know, um, thought upon and not taken as a as a metaphor um my um thank you for asking about my current project because i've been i started already talking about it um i um once i finished this you know uh, book on on the culture of productivity i realized that there's so much um to think about in the um in the realm of morality. I mean, I looked at it from the, you know, moralization of discourses of, you know, moralization of work, and um, it became a major source for at least for two chapters of my book. But now I want to, you know, shift my focus to a cohort of moralists, and one of them is Ali Kemal, a cohort of moralists, and and how they had different uh, backgrounds, different ideologies, different ethno-linguistic, you know, uh, ethno-confessional backgrounds, and how they had uh, a, a variety, sometimes conflictual understandings of a political moral world. So, um, and I want to, you know, situate so maybe several cohorts. I'm not sure about that. Um, these cohorts of moralists. And loosely defined, right? Uh, moralists in 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 the um, institutional um, history of the Ottoman Empire uh, in the last maybe thirty years of the Ottoman Empire. So this is something I I, I think because you know this understanding of uh, citizenship, moralization of citizenship, and politicization of morality is still very vibrant today. Uh, so I want to explore 
the formative years of that kind of a moralization of citizenship and a politicization of morality going back to the, uh, you know, back to the 19th century. Lisa, was, thank you for talking to us at Memo Conversation. Thank you. Thank you. This was this was great. Thank you, Osman. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. Please do tune in next time for more Memo Conversations. This was Middle East Monitor Conversations, brought to you by the Middle East Monitor in London. <laughs>